night different. <laughs> Office. Office. What time is it? Nighttime. Can you cut off the light? Can you cut on the light? I will when I come back. How did I get here? How did I get here? In the darkest place, in one of the darkest places one can find themselves. A maximum security prison on 24-hour lockdown. A place so dark, you can't even control your own lights. Just 365 days prior, I was headed off the yard, headed back to my cell, and then all hell broke. Stop! Stop! Get down! Get down! Boom! Came the first shot from the gun tower. JP, just stop, man, just stop. Boom! Came the second shot from the gun tower. Just lay down, man, just lay down somewhere, yeah. I don't know where I was running to. I just felt like I had to keep running. As the third shot rang out, I just stopped and lay on the ground and allowed myself to be cuffed. I surrendered. For a while, I wondered if that second shot had hit me instead of the dirt, how things might have been different. Should I have surrendered? This is the second time I've surrendered look how things turned out. Never again. Never again, I told myself. This story begins here, but this isn't the beginning, nor is it the end. It's just the beginning. I had just turned 18 when I went in for questioning. I was 42 when I walked out. For over two decades, I, I, I spent over two decades in prison because at 19, I was convicted of first-degree gang-related murder. And although I wasn't guilty, I wasn't innocent either. Now, what does that mean? It means that I chose a path that would ultimately lead to that tiny dark cell. Well, not the tiny dark cell. I ultimately chose a path that would lead to, a t to, to prison but not that tiny dark cell. You see, I had everything to do with how I landed in that tiny dark cell, but not how I landed in prison. In both instances, I surrendered. And as I lay in that tiny dark cell, I realized that I had been surrendering most of my life, but never again. At 12, I jumped off the porch, as the young people say. What that really means is that I had surrendered to the streets the streets have been calling for as long as I can remember. Johnny. Johnny. And finally I listened. I don't know what day it was in my nearly 12th year of existence, but on one of those days in my 12th year, I surrendered. I surrendered to the streets and all that came with it, hustling, gangs, and ultimately, Prison. During the Passover, you retell the story. You, tell, you retell the story of Exodus. You retell the story so that you never forget. You retell the story so that you remember. You retell the story so that no one forgets. You remember who you are and from where you came. While I'm told that I should forget. That I should forget. 400 years of slavery, that I should forget 100 years of Jim Crow, that I should forget 23 years and nine months of wrongful imprisonment, that I should forget. But I can't, and I won't, because I'm a survivor. And as a survivor, I must tell the story, and I must retell the story. Why is this night different? Because as I lay in that dark cell so long ago, which seems like 
not so long ago. I vow never again. Never again to surrender. And I will remember this night because remembrance is an act of resistance. So again, why is this night different? This night is different because on this night, I remember all that I've been told to forget. My name is Johnny Page. I'm the uh, co-director for Programs and Partnerships with Contexto. I want to welcome you all to a night to just listen. This is the first in a series of nights where we're just asking folks to listen. We're not asking you for anything but to listen. Because sometimes folks just need to listen. Um, I want to introduce you to um, my colleague and the executive director of Contextos, Deborah Gillis. Hi, thank you so much for having us, Hug um, I want to thank Joel and Tracy and Melanie and Rabbi Fenster, my big sister Susie. Um, <laughs> We have been engaging for about a year with Contextos. As Johnny said, I'm the founder and executive director. Um, when we were trying to figure out what was meaningful, Joel said, well, what about a night nice just to listen? And that felt so meaningful because in the work that we do at Contextos, people often want to know what to do, right? What do um, well-intentioned white people in the North Shore do about how bad the world is? And when we try to answer that question, what comes up over and over is, uh, listen, just listen. Sometimes you don't have to do much more. And it seems pretty apropos that Passover is the moment that we can do this. Right? Passover is my favorite holiday. Um, it's the basis not only of all my Jewishness, but my values as a human being. It's strongly related to social justice. It's about storytelling around the table, um, retelling and retelling and asking questions, of course food, retelling and asking questions in order not only to make better sense of the past, um, but to broaden our scope of what the future might look like opening a space that story isn't the absolute, but it's a space to start reckoning with and wrestling to make our understanding. And that's really closely tied to the work that we do in Contexto. So I want to tell you a little bit about my story and how the work that we do inadvertently became so tied up with the story of Passover. Um, and a little bit about how an upper middle class white girl who went to University of Chicago Lab Schools and honors at University of Michigan and got my graduate degree at Harvard ended up finding the most learned spaces in third world prison and Cook County Jail. Um, so when we started Contextos, well, when I did 12 years ago in El Salvador, which is a whole other story of how that happened, it was after my previous job, which was working in education reform in Latin America. And so Latin America, like most developing countries, kids learn through rote memory, copy, and dictation. They do not have the beautiful spaces like you guys have in BJPE. Books are too precious to be used, so they are not. Kids don't learn that story is something to be utilized to make meaning, it's something to be memorized or copied. And so we started off doing the basic work that I know my sister does so well here of creating libraries and training teachers and creating spaces where children could wrestle with each other, not physically, but using story as a way to explore themselves and each other and understanding that the words on a page aren't just to be read aloud, but to be considered. So it was our second year when I got asked to visit Corinto School, which is a school high up on the mountains, rural El Salvador, very beautiful. If you've been to Costa Rica, it might look like that. I would say prettier. Beautiful view of the Pacific Ocean. And the kindergarten teacher and first grade teachers had invited me in because they wanted us to see all of their new practices. And then that day I showed up to see um, two first graders arguing about what would happen if Clifford, the big red dog, and Froggy, um, the little green frog, if they were to meet in real life, what would happen? And the little boy's like, oh my God, they would never get along. They're both so mischievous. And the little girl says, yo no estoy de acuerdo. I do not agree with you. She said, um, they're both so clever, they're gonna end up having a lot of fun together and being friends. And that was this moment, right? Because um, it was really simple, just stories. Clifford the big red dog. But something bigger was happening. And that's what we wanted to do, not just to read better or faster, but to think bigger. That's what we do around the Seder table, right? We retell the story, not just to retell it, but to think differently about our past and what the future can be. So a year later, when Corinto School asked me to come back, again, I was excited to see what our teachers were doing. And this time we filed into 
the small school library. The library had previously been a kitchen. It was abandoned. It was very cute. And there were seventh graders who were all lined up and ready. I had brought some of my colleagues. Uh, the first one to present was a little girl named Wendy. So these seventh graders, we've been in the school for three years now, so I'd known these kids for a while. And I actually knew Wendy pretty well because she worked, I'm sorry, she lived at a home right in front of the school. Um, dirt patio, she had a bunch of little siblings, her mom was always there, her house was made out of tin laminate and mud. And she stood in front of this audience and opened her notebook and started to read aloud. Um, and I remember the first line she read because she read about seeing her reflection in the wakal. And a wakal is, um, is the bowl that you use to retrieve water from a rain barrel because there's no running water. So she was looking at her reflection in the water of the wakal when she heard her father's cries. Um, and her story went on to talk about how her father, who worked at a sugarcane field, was burnt in one of the fires, because that's how you take care of sugarcane. And ultimately, after three days at home in agony, died. <coughs> and as I listened to the story, my first response was sort of mortification, because I thought, oh my god, this little girl is doing exactly what we don't want. She's copied the story. How could this child from the middle of nowhere, who three years ago was only copying stories, where could she have found the insight for this just excruciating beauty and this precision of language and then I was listening to her classmates and their stories were the same just profound and that was clear right these little people had huge stories and huge experiences and that we were not talking about Clifford anymore and that was a huge pivot point for us as an organization one because at that time the international community started to recognize that the drug wars were no longer being fought in central in in Mexico and Colombia they were being pushed into Central America. So you guys probably have heard about some of those kinds of things, the violence that's present in the Northern Triangle. And so while we were thinking about this new obligation we had, what are we gonna do to help people tell their stories, these young people? We knew that we also had a mandate to work in even more difficult settings. And so for rural schools, we decided to move into urban schools in what was considered um, gang recruitment zones. And the idea was, or the, the mythology was, that the kids on their way to school were gonna be attacked by gangs, they were being attacked by gangs and being recruited, so perhaps we should shut down the schools in order to keep these children safe. So we decided we would go into these schools like out of the movies, you know, graffiti all over, gang graffiti all over their classrooms, and we create this radical space of vulnerability and storytelling in a circle, kind of like a Seder table, to so start telling our stories. And for us, we've always been rooted in the literary. So drafting, revising, editing, and ultimately publishing those stories. But not publishing them just to put them out in the world, publishing them as tools to bring family and community, those who are close and those who are far away, to listen to these stories and wrestle with them and ask questions about them. Um, that was right when about 70,000 Central American youth showed up on the, on the border of Texas and the United States. And so all the press and politicians were trying to explain this phenomenon. We were standing in the places with these young people who had made that journey themselves. They were telling stories about getting home and their family wasn't there anymore and it was months until they got a phone call that mom was okay. Uh, they were stories overwhelmingly filled with grief and loss and none of them were about gang recruitment and none of them were about gangs. That point, the US Embassy of all places, the State Department came to us recognizing that this issue of gangs and violence was increasingly present and asked if we would be able to work with even more vulnerable youth. And so it's like, well, we're working in rural schools, we're working with urban schools, you know, K through 12, who could possibly be left? And they asked if we would go into um, prisons and juvenile detention centers, and we did. And what we found is they're the same stories and the same people and the same power of a story to sit into a space and to build our stories, to share them, to tell them, to publish them, to write them down, and to read them, and to use those stories, our stories, to create other spaces for others to kick off their stories. And then I was invited back into Chicago to talk about my work in El Salvador. It was 2015, 2016, it had been a big year in Chicago. It's about, what's Chicago, like 2.73 million people? We had had 762 homicides the year before, and Chicago was afraid. And I had left El Salvador, which is, San Salvador is about 2.73 million, and the year before they had 6,600 homicides. And both are very similar. It's young people who are dying, uh, and it's young people who are being accused of perpetrating most of that. And what I said in my talk was that one thing I had learned, one thing that we know, 
is that hurt people hurt people. And that um, I was sure, even though I worked with people who were accused of doing some pretty horrible things, I didn't know what many of them had done or not done, but I knew that almost all of them had been victims of violence, and certainly all of them had been witnesses to violence. And that perhaps if we were to think differently about the way that violence happens and what people's experiences are, not to assume, but to actually look at the words that they want to put on a page. If we were to look at their own stories and wrestle their, their own stories, what are the new stories that we would tell what we would find? Um, and that night was different for me because that night I got to meet Sheriff Tom Dart. And Tom Dart was getting really well known, not only for running the second largest jail in the country, Cook County Jail, but because he was becoming a reformer who was saying, it's not just the second largest jail, it's the single largest mental health institute in the United States of America. And he came to me and said, literally, if it works in a third world prison, it has to work here. And that's how we grew from El Salvador to Chicago, and pretty quickly from our work in Cook County Jail into schools on the south and west sides and reentry and workforce development, just like what we had grown through in Central America. Always with the same basic concept something very similar to what we do in Passover. We sit in a circle, we start with the stories of those who come before us. All of our circles are born out of the stories, first from El Salvador, now from our authors here in Chicago, and we read those stories as we wrestle with our own stories, and we use them to ask questions, and we use them to reconsider, and we use them to promote dialogue, and we use them as tools to write what we need to tell the world. That's the work that we've done, it's the work that we continue to do, and so tonight to be here with you guys and be able to share some of the stories and the power of what storytelling means, the power of what it means to be able to look back in reflection, not only for our own accountability, but a shared accountability. What does it mean to look at those stories and tell them collectively? So this is the first time that we're really moving from the literary into the spoken word, and that's our goal with you, you're like our trial audience. Uh, I think that Jews are an obvious audience for our work because there's an innate understanding, hopefully. The question of what to do, you know, what to do when things are so difficult, and I would argue is to listen. And so it's a really um, huge honor for me to have two more of my colleagues with us tonight. Um, so I'm gonna introduce Jonathan Ivory, who is one of our authors and now one of our facilitators. All right. Thank you, everyone, for the applause. I'm not as confident about talking uh, as Johnny and uh, Deborah was. So bear with me a little bit. Um, but it's, it's good to be with y'all tonight. Um, I'm going to start with my story, share my story with y'all, okay? So this night should be like any other night. Going to work, do my eight hours, and go home. But unbeknownst to me, my whole life would be forever changed. Get down, get down. I turn around and see who's joking with me. But as I turn around, I realize it's not a joke. Eight guns are pointed at me. And I'm so overcome with fear, I don't know what to do. I mean, I know what to do, but it's like my body won't let me. My legs were frozen. After a few seconds, I come out of my stupor and I <coughs> kneel to the ground. As I kneel, I'm instantly tapped thrown to the side, and handcuffed so tight it feels like the cuffs are cutting my wrist. Now, on the ride to the station, I know why they got me back here. They want to question me about a night I was hanging out with some friends in which an incident occurred and someone ended up losing their life. But I thought I was okay because I didn't do anything wrong. But boy, was I wrong. I didn't cooperate with the police when I got to the police station because being raised where I'm from, I was taught snitches get stitches. <clears throat> so that night, I didn't tell my story. So someone made one up for me. The next thing I know, the officer comes to my cell and says, Mr. Ivory, you charged me with first degree murder. You have the right to remain silent, blah, 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 blah. After he said murder, I was dumbfounded. How? This has got to be some type of prank. But after every hour that passed, I realized this is really happening. In the morning, the van came to the police station to pick me up. I walk out to the back of the door of the van, 
and it opens up to the two individuals that I was with that night by the event. When I seen them, I see red. I'm so angry, I wanna hurt them, but I can't do anything, my hands are cut. So I get to the van. On the way to the county jail, it was a 10 minute awkward silence, man. I mean, tension was so thick and cut butter. I think I, I even had heat coming off me. But um, my supposed friend asked me, what did I tell the police? I told him nothing. I told him I wanted a lawyer. He looks at his friend and nods. I asked, what was that nod for? Like we told him the same thing. They said, um, so two months in, I get an attorney visit for my attorney. And when I met her, I just got this feeling that this lady's not gonna help me. Um, because I tried to tell her my story and she wouldn't even really listen to me. I guess she had one made up already. Another two months go by and I get another visit. But this attorney visit blew my mind because she had some of my discovery with, with her, which was some of the evidence the state supposedly had against me. So she tells me, your co-defendants are turning on you. I said, well, what do you mean turning on me? She says, yeah, they have statements saying that you shot and killed someone. I blurt out, that's ridiculous. I didn't kill anyone. What about the cell phone that was found at the scene? That's not mine. What about the gym shoe that was found at the scene? That has DNA on it, right? Can't they do some type of test? She tells me, we'll have to do an investigation, have experts look at everything, but these things take time. Time. Fast forward, three years later. <laughs> I have another visit. I could already tell this is not going to be good because she doesn't even have my file with her. She just has a briefcase. She starts off by telling me things are looking good. Um, your co-defendants are taking deals. They offered you a deal of 31 years. It's a really good deal. I could put together a mitigation package and maybe get it down to 25, but it's your first offense. I looked at her like she was crazy. First of all, I'm not admitted to something I didn't do. Secondly, why aren't you helping me? CO, CO, I'm ready to leave. Get me out of here. A month later, I go to court at Maybrook Courthouse and I get called out to the courtroom. It's not a big courtroom. You can take it in all at one glance. But in that one glance, I didn't see my attorney. Mr. Ivory, how are you today? Judge asked me. I'm okay, Judge. Well, we've just been informed that your attorney has retired. What? This can't be happening. You mean to tell me you didn't know what the judge says? No. Oh, this is so sad and unprofessional. I couldn't believe this was happening. I felt abandoned, hopeless. After that court, late, court date, I felt like this was gonna be my life. So I got a continuance. Um, I think it was about like two months to let my new attorney get caught up with the case and stuff. So my new attorney comes to visit me, a man named James Ryan. And as soon as I seen him, I'm like, oh man, I got this short little disheveled man. He looks like he's all over the place. He asked me how I was doing. I said, fine, considering the circumstances. And he said, I've been going over your file. And your last attorney seems like they weren't doing anything. I was like, oh, so you noticed. He's like, yeah, but you have a really good case. They don't have anything on you. But as you know, these things take time. Time, time, that's why I keep hearing. So I came to the realization that patience is the key to staying sane in this hellhole. After my visit with James, I felt a sense of relief. Not only was this man trying to help me, he was willing to lie for me. Because he tried to make up a story, but I told him, no, let's stick to the truth. <laughs> my spirit was so high because with him, I felt like I would have my day in court. I started to get involved in programs in jail so I could be better prepared for when I got out because I knew I was gonna be free again. 
I got involved in chess, which I found a passion for and became very good at it. I was selected to be in the first international chess tournament for detainees and prisoners. England, Brazil, Italy, Belarus, Armenia, France, and even Russia <laughs> was in the uh, tournament. We didn't win, we came in like fourth, fifth, I think, but I was a part of it. And also I got to be on the news and in the newspapers. I joined the Contestos program that introduced me to writing and found another passion. I took a philosophy class about morality provided by Northwestern and many more programs that Cook County Jail provided. I was taking advantage of what the county was offering me. Also, I found hope in God. I learned that Yahweh is real. I also, I was at about three and a half years when this sense of hope overtook me. Me and my co-defendants were still going to court together. I could have fought them, tried to hurt them, but that would have only made my situation worse. With my new way of thinking, and with God with me, I found the power of forgiveness. And with this power, I was able to tell these two individuals who I felt had me fighting for my life and freedom that I understand, that I understand what y'all did, and I'm not mad anymore. And y'all can do whatever y'all have to do to protect yourselves because I know God got me. After that day, I never seen him again. The next month, my attorney tells me they both took deals, 10 years at 50%, and another 15 at 50%. I think he was waiting for my reaction because he paused for a couple seconds, but I didn't care. Then he tells me we have new video evidence that shows that you, what you were wearing that night, and that's not the person in the video. Two years, five years later now, we set for trial. And I learned I don't just have one lawyer, I have three working on the case. So we are ready. I go to, tri I go to court expecting trial and find out the state's attorney that's on my case is no longer there. This is a good sign, my lawyer says. I'm wondering how, I have to sit in here longer. Another year passes, but I know God got it. So we set for trial in year six, COVID hits. No one's going to court now. Once the COVID cases drop, the courts open back up. James comes to visit me in the month of October and tells me I have good news. I'm working on getting you a deal. Same one like your co defendants got. You'll have a record, but at least you'll be free. I tell him, okay, let's do it, because I'm tired of this place. So my lawyer has an evidentiary hearing with the judge and state's attorney, or some sort of hearing. Now my judge is getting tired of seeing me in this case at this point, and he asks the state's attorney, what's taking so long? He tells them they're working on a deal with my attorney. The judge says get it done, because I'm looking at the evidence, and this case only warrants 15 to 17 years day for day. After finding out this information, I was ecstatic. I'm going home. Four months later, I go to court expecting to take the deal, only to find out this state's attorney is no longer on my case. The judge is livid at this point. <coughs> so he sets a trial date for March 23rd and says both parties better be ready. My last attorney visit was the most memorable for me because I wanted to go with the jury trial and let 12 people decide instead of take a bench trial and let one man determine my future. But James knew better. He said, we're going to do a bench trial. The judge is fair and he knows the case. Plus, he already said what type of sentence you'll get if he finds you guilty. So we took a bench trial. On my trial date, I, was, I wasn't I was nervous at all until I got into the courtroom. My leg wouldn't sit still, my armpits wouldn't stop sweating. <laughs> what calmed me down was my girlfriend's mother, though. She put her hands together as if praying, and it grounded me. The state presented their case first, and it made it seem like I was a minister to society, and they knew nothing about me. It was scary because what if the judge believes these lies? No negative thoughts, I told myself. My attorney went next, and boy, were they prepared. Counted everything the state said. Counted everything the state was saying with true facts. The 
The icing on the cake, though, was when the videos were played and it was seen that I was not the person in the video that took another's life. Seven years, four months, and 24 days later, free man. to bring up another Contextos published author and a good friend of mine, Mr. Trevor Lester. All right, thank you. How are you guys doing today? Thank you in advance for listening. And uh, unlike Johnny and Deborah here, bear with me. I'm a little not used to public speaking, so bear with me. But Show me your friends, son. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Watch the company you keep, son. Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. My father had constantly reminded me of this since my younger days. And now here I was, cuffs around my wrists, chain around my waist, shackles around my ankles, and a stranger to the left of me. I was so deep in thought that I hadn't even realized that the older man next to me had thrown up all over the floor of the bus. Today was the most important day of my life in the last eight years. Today I was scheduled to start my trial. And today I would be seen as a human again if I had won. I have been incarcerated awaiting trial since 2012. And the last eight years of my life have been very, very uncomfortable. Part of being a man is being able to hold yourself accountable for your actions as well as look in the mirror and know exactly who you see in the reflection. That's something that took me a lot of years to actually understand. I know who I am, but will they? By this point, my mind was racing, and to be honest, I was completely afraid of the thought that I would have to spend the rest of my life in prison for a crime I didn't commit. All I can do now at this moment was reflect on every decision I had made leading up to this present time. And despite being charged with a murder that I didn't commit, I always maintain hope and faith that things will work out in my favor. But right now, my reality consisted of seeing the faces and hearing the voices of the hopeless. <coughs> I walked into the courtroom and I knew something was wrong. I knew this because the bailiff for the courtroom didn't come and get me so I can change my clothes into my suit that my family had bought me for today's trial. So I approached the bench and the judge greeted me with a good morning. <coughs> she said, Mr. Lester, today is your lucky day. You'll be getting a second chance at life, so don't ruin it. And she then proceeded to tell me that due to insufficient evidence, the murder charges were dropped. At that point, I was overwhelmed with emotion and I also felt good. But at the same time, I was kind of torn because I still had other charges to face, which included home invasion, kidnapping, and robbery, all of which I didn't commit. But what I, but what I was guilty of was living a fast-paced lifestyle that enabled and allowed people who shouldn't have been around me, around me, to be around me. So, now I felt like I really understood what my father used to tell me when I was a child in regards to who I surround myself with and my choice of company. After eight years of fighting and fighting and fighting for my freedom, I would finally get the chance to be a free man again. I was overwhelmed with emotions, happiness, anxiousness, and excitement. It felt like a weight of been lifted off my shoulders because the last eight years I had been in an environment that breathed nothing but constant chaos, fights, um, drug use, and it was it was a lot. So I guess I was used to this type of environment now, which honestly made me feel a little bit sad at times. But you never know how strong you are until being strong is the only choice that you have. The company that I once kept and the so-called friends that I surrounded myself with, they didn't exist to me anymore. Years have passed. They continue to live their lives as they should. But sometimes I felt alone. 
but this was a bright spot. I still had to be, excuse me, I'm sorry. On the bus ride back to Cook County, because I still had to take a bus because I had other charges, so I was only one step closer to gaining my freedom and getting my innocence back completely. But on the bus ride home, I was still excited and I was kind of back in the days, I was thinking about a lot of things, my future, spending time with my family. And um, I thought of my father again, and I thought of him because what he always used to tell me in my childhood, I had lived a firsthand experience of that and what could happen if I surround myself with the wrong people and just live a lifestyle that breeds negative things. Even if you're not firsthand doing these bad things, but if you surround yourself with these people, it can spill over into your life. And that's something that I had to learn the hard way. But I was hopeful and very, very grateful that I would once again get my freedom and I was no longer guilty by association. Thank you for listening. So our goal is just to have all of the storytellers come up and then questions and answers. I mean, 